Great. Good morning. This is the uh, net zero subcommittee of the Amherst School Building Committee. Um, and we are meeting today uh, with our uh, design team to begin to get into the, the details. Um, and I will turn it over to Donna uh, who, uh, and or Tim who has a, a kind of formal schedule of the things we're going to, to go over today. Oh, Donna, we can't hear you. I was just, thank you. And I'm, Tim Tim is um, has uh, worked really hard. So we do apologize for um, not getting a draft out. We got it out late last night. We were just, more information keeps coming in and more developments are occurring. So I think we're posting the presentation now. Tim, I think just sent it to Angela. So uh, as, as hard as we tried to get it out in advance, we apologize. Um, we have some members with us today. Just wanna to introduce you to them. Everyone knows Tim and everyone knows Rick. Uh, we have Nate Russell from GZA for our uh, ground source heat pumps. He'll be instrumental in um, the calculations, et cetera, for the energy that we are able to get out of the wells, set up a test well if this is the direction we're going. Uh, we have Alfonso Espinosa, if I said that correct, correct, Al Alonso. Um, Alonso wow. is our new team member from Thornton Tomasetti. So Alonso is with us. Um, we also have another new team member from Thornton Tomasetti, uh, Allie, and she was unable to join us this morning, but she was instrumental in the success of the Net Zero Fail School. So we felt that she would be a huge contributor to the oh. entire process, but she was unable to make it this morning. And then I believe everyone knows Samoon O, our mechanical engineer from BAV. So with that, Tim, who has worked so hard on this. Thanks, Tim. Um, thanks for the introduction. That's uh, nice. Uh, Samoon, uh, hey, Donna, do, do we need to introduce the committee members to your new team members? Sure, that, sure. Go, go, thank you, Margaret. Margaret is Margaret Wood from Ansler, who's the OPM. And then Jonathan uh, Salva. More importantly. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm Jonathan uh, Salva. I'm, I'm, I'm the chair of the subcommittee, but I'm, I'm a, a member of the, the larger committee. And, and um, he is a local architect yes. with Kuhn Riddle, which just yes. to put reference to his um, purpose, I guess, for his volunteerism. Um, and we have uh, Ben Harrington, who is a school committee member, a building committee member, as well as uh, works in the facilities department for Amherst Public Schools. And Rupert Roy Clark, who is also in the building committee, but the director of facilities. So these gentlemen have to be 100% comfortable with whatever solution we have so that um, they can maintain and operate it. And then I think this must be Shelley Potter, who's, who's Margaret Wood, alias Margaret Wood. <laughs> Don't forget Kathy. I, I just assume everyone knows Kathy. I am <laughs> so sorry. No, that's, Kathy, that's okay. You're just such a fixture at every one of these meetings. I am so sorry. <laughs> Kathy Shane, who is uh, the chair of the school building committee, who is also a town counselor, who is also the chair of the finance committee, who is uh, vice chair, vice chair, vice chair. Yeah. Um, who, who this all of all of this um, truly couldn't happen if if she hasn't it without Kathy. So um, um, for that. I, is that we good, Tim? Let's get into the fun stuff. Yeah, let, let, let's uh, let's start going. Uh, just before I share my screen, um, in general, what we're going to do is talk about uh, the schedule for this aspect of SD and when we want to reach a decision on air source, first ground source, and then uh, Sim will 
I talk a little bit about a qualitative comparison between the two systems. Uh, Alonzo is here to talk about the process and the mechanics of the modeling and the tools that we use to analyze um, the different systems and how they work with the building. And then uh, Stump said Nate is here to answer any questions that we have and a brief discussion about the uh, mechanics of the geothermal wells that will be part of a ground source system if that is selected. Uh, with that, I'm going to share my screen. And first thing is schedule. So these are just a few of the things um, of all the balls that are going to be in the FRSD. But uh, for this conversation, uh, we're going to narrow it down to a few specific tasks. Um, you'll notice that we have this discussion throughout July. We're, we're not going to be asking for a recommendation at this meeting. Um, this description of four weeks takes all of the time that it would be comfortable to allow everyone to do their work, uh, most importantly, Simone, um, in the mechanical design of the building uh, that would allow us to get to a quality design that will give us a good cost estimate and allow us to submit a good package at the end of SD. Um, this, the line below that decision is the amount of time it would schedule to perform a test well that would give us real data better than the estimates that we have for how well uh, the wells on site would perform and allow for a, a much tighter design. And then below that is the time that someone would take to design the mechanical systems at an SD level. Which brings us to when we would have to give the documents to our cost estimator at the beginning of November. Uh, there's a period for estimation and reconciliation, which would then allow a few weeks before any decisions, including VE or other options that have to be decided on before a final vote of the submission to the MSBA. Um, we have it scheduled for mid-December. Um, the actual submission would probably be very early in 2023, but those dates have not yet been determined by the MSBA. So we are scheduling this out as the best we can. And then we should probably note that this is kind of, this is generally paralleling the, the schedule for the, the balance of the design as well. You know, that these target end dates um, are the same target end dates for, for the, the rest of the uh, schematic design. Absolutely true. Um, beside what is shown here, there are many other things, including room data sheets, what the building will look like, plan of the building, and all of those will be concurrently happening with this effort in the background. So, so I just, I think I just, um, everyone's seeing that the test well, you can see the duration of a test well, and Nate's here to talk a little bit more about that, but um, there, there are very few companies that uh, we feel comfortable with doing the test well, and I believe they're about eight weeks out. Um, there's also a process that we have to go through. We do have to go to the Board of Health uh, in order to um, get their permission to actually drill it. And then once they drill it and we get the data that we need, then, then there'll be some back and forth and we can talk about you know, quantity, do we go a little light, do we go a little heavy, whatever. So, so there's conversation that would occur. So um, you can see backing up into MSBA's vote, I, I hope everyone is comfortable with decision of uh, ground source versus air source with this group, and then we have to bring it to the building committee. Yes. Margaret, I mean, Kathy. Yeah. Uh, just, just on, um both that July period and then the test well period, you said you have to go to the Board of Health. Does the Conservation Commission with wetlands and issues, does it get involved at all around um, a well? You know, um, I know it does more generally with the bill. So I'm just asking the interaction with a well. And then my other question on the test well is, um, I don't think this is an issue, but when you're doing a test well and you go deep, are you you're doing soil samples also to um, it, at all? Are you doing them at all? And um, is the plan if we go to ground source that we would reuse that soil as part of the um, building up 
the ground. So testing of the soil, it, it, when you go deeper, those two questions for any contaminants uh, or other concerns, yeah. Um, there are multiple parts to that question and I'm gonna, Nate, handle some of them. But one uh, that I can speak to is that uh, the amount of soil displaced is not that much and it won't be uh, used for other purposes. And also there will be other testing going on in site that's not shown on the schedule, including test pits and geotechnical borings that, and other sampling that will be in addition to that. And then maybe Nate, if you just wanna speak to the depth and a few other technical aspects of the drilling uh, yeah. so Kathy can understand. Sure, um, so the, the, the drilling for a test well is a little different than our traditional geotechnical borings. Um, we, it's usually a rotary hammer or air hammer equipment. To, it's, it's kind of a, akin to drilling a water well. So if you've seen a, a groundwater supply well go in, it's, it's very similar equipment. The cuttings that come out are wet and <laughs> not really something that we would use on site. And we don't really have an opportunity to sample uh, just because of the nature of the drilling, it's not representative. They were circulating water and mud at times. So generally what we are doing during the drilling is just observing potential changes in color and, and, and sort of drilling action to get idea of stratification if we can, um, but not from a traditional soil sampling standpoint. Um, the purview of the CONCOM, so we don't know exactly where the well is going to be at this point, but assuming it's, if it's outside their jurisdictional limits, then obviously there's no, no issue there. Um, but even when you're inside a regulatory area for investigations, so traditionally geotechnical borings, um, test pits, things like that, and often a test well is considered similar to that, it is exempt from requiring to file for an RDA or notice of, uh, of intent, as long as we're not impacting the wetland itself. So if we're just in the buffer zone, you know, either in the, the buffer to a BBW or in the rear front area, if there, if there is that on the site, um, that's fine. We can do that work as part of uh, exploration. Investigation. Kathy, I think, I think, you know, now, um, we, we want to get going on the ANRAD, the wetland flagging. We, so, so this will be, you know, we've already had, hopefully we, at, by the time we start drilling and we have identified the location of it, certainly we would have been before Conservation Commission to make sure that they don't have any concerns with it. The, the reason I raised it is Tim said health department. So I was just looking at which Two, two entities would be looking at this. That's you answered it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the health department specifically requires a permit for geothermal wells. Okay. And and just to uh, before you dive further into it, Tim, um, you know, I, I would like it if we can maybe do the presentation in about an hour so that we can then pause for some uh, public uh, comments and then. Um, and, and then get comment also from, from the committee. Does, it, does that sound reasonable? I'm not sure how much time you've had allotted in your head to, to the presentation. I think that's totally reasonable. I mean, I anticipated that we would get through our presentation maybe a little bit less than that, and then there would be a, a robust conversation, if you will. Great. Um, with that, actually, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Samoon uh, for a, a little bit of a qualitative uh, discussion of the difference between the various aspects of a building that is heated and cooled with a air source system versus a ground source system. Hi. Uh, could you hear me? Yes, we, we can hear you. Okay, good. Okay, first item is that I categorize general area is that uh, is the system all electric as per bylaw, Amherst bylaw, and both qualifies as yes. Energy source for ground source is of course ground and it has a steady 55 degrees year round, which is very important for steady performance and efficiency. While air source heat pump system, air varies from zero to 95 degrees. Uh, so. Uh, its efficiency greatly depends on uh, outside conditions. First cost, the ground source is higher and air source is lower. 
operating cost is lower for the ground source. EUI of 25 is possible, which uh, Alonzo will go in deeper later on. And air source has higher uh, operating cost. System longevity is, it's a geothermal system is a, a ground source is pretty much proven. So it goes 20 to 30 years. And air source heat pump is shorter. Is net zero possible? Ground source is yes. Air source is yes, but with more uh, photovoltaic farm because it's less efficient. Maintenance for ground source is same as the, any central water cooled plant. Air source is higher because it has more lighter duty uh, components and outdoor equipment. So you have to service that if you have to service during the winter time, it's a little tougher and it must be kept free of uh, snow drift. Outdoor units, geothermal units, uh, wells are all underground, so nothing visible is uh, around and there is no items to be maintained outdoors. Air source heat pump is modular units uh, of a 20 ton capacity and most likely be located on the roof. Uh, therefore, it will reduce the opportunity for photovoltaics on the roof. Noise level for outdoor level, there is no outdoor noise source. Uh, air source heat pump, you will have, uh, uh, what's it, uh, a noise source on the roof, which, and I don't think there is enough uh, residents nearby, so that's not going to be a concern. Indoor plant, uh, ground source has a modular water to water heat pump units, and air source heat pump has none that uh, needs to allocate additional space except the uh, distribution boxes. Uh, Indoor units, I mean, uh, indoor units, units in classroom spaces, uh, ground source heat pump, we will be utilizing chill, most likely chill beans or ducted fan coil units. Air source will be ducted fan coil units that's uh, refrigerant based. Units in other spaces, well, uh, ground source is ducted fan coil units and same for the BIF system. Units in larger space, they're both the same, handling units. And energy distribution, which is pretty important, is the uh, ground source is just full pipe water piping versus uh, air source heat pump is all refrigerant piping. Noise level in ground source is quiet to extremely quiet, extremely quiet being the children system. And air source heat pump is uh, also quiet, well within the lead requirements. Fresh air. Central units, ERU on the roof, it will allow a dual core regenerative. And same thing to the uh, unit, the other unit. Uh, could we go a little lower, Tim? Other consideration, heat recovery. Ground source, part of the reason why it's efficient is that it, uh, it's a real central system that covers the entire building. So if you have a heat recovery opportunity in one part of the building, it affects the entire building, which is pretty nice. Where air source heat pump system comes in 20 ton modules. So heat recovery is only possible in, within that uh, area covered by 20 ton. Domestic hot water, preheating from any time you have cooling uh, requirements in the building, you have a rejected heat and you could use that to generate pre-cooled, uh, preheat the domestic water. And air source heat pump system, you have to have dedicated unit for preheating. Lead enhanced refrigerant management, possible uh, easily with ground source. Air source, you cannot because you got large amount of refrigerant within the building. MERV 13 filters in space, uh, you cannot do with chill beam, but yes, with the bank or units and animal units. Yes, with limitation in, in that they do give you MERV 13 filters, but they don't last that long. MERV 13 filters, ERU, yes for both. UV lights in, uh, in the flat fan cooling is not recommended in both cases because it's got exposed insulation, which degrades with the presence of UVC light. Uh, UV uh, lights in ERU, yes. Maintenance staff, for ground source, will be just standard uh, maintenance staff or repair technicians. Where air PRF system, we have, have to have a refrigerant mechanic. Emergency heating, because uh, uh, bylaw does not permit use of gas or anything but generator, will require fairly large generator size by at least half the capacity. 
That's it, then. Okay. Um, thank you, Simone. Um, actually, we're going to move to uh, Alonzo now to um, just a little bit background on the process of how uh, the energy modeling works in the software that's used. Yeah, th thank you. And I hope everybody can, can hear me. Um, so I am Alonso Dominguez with TT. I'm a new member of, of, of the team. Um, I wanted to introduce you or, or, or walk you through a little bit of our energy model process, hoping that it uh, will make it more transparent, basically, um, uh, for, for all of you. So we have basically three steps, um, and it ultimately ends up in what in a program a software called Energy Plus. Energy Plus is ultimately the um, the, the the actual modeling software. But before we go to Energy Plus, the, the first thing that we do is we create a geometry in a software called Rhino 3D that uh, you know I'm pretty sure a lot of architects are, are very familiar with it because it's it's generally used to to um, to, to model. Uh, architecture architecture plans as well, but we use it to generate basically the geometry of the energy model. Um, then we incorporate that energy model into a Grasshopper script. Grasshopper is a plugin for Rhino 3D, um, and it allow and and it allows us basically to assign to each one of the zones uh, the equipment power, the light power, the occupants, the schedules that we're using, the HVAC system, terminal unit that is that is serving it, and so on. And then out of out of that script, we generate basically um, really an Open Studio file. So Open Studio is is a visual, basically a visual interface for Energy Plus. Um, so we, we generate that Open Studio, and then we can actually modify some other additional um, additional things in Open Studio. Uh, for example, we're we're able to to ask for certain inputs. We're able to ask for certain outputs of the energy model, and then we run it through Open Studio. But what Open Studio is doing in the background is basically creating this Energy Plus model. Energy Plus doesn't really have a user interface. It's literally just a um, a command window that pops up on your screen, and it, you just see a lot of text. But um, that's why you need Open Studio to basically visualize uh, that that uh, user interface for that one. Open, both Open Studio and Energy Plus are actually part of the U.S. Uh, Department of Energy and Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Office. They, they, it was developed first by DOE, and and it's been considered since then basically the gold standard in energy modeling. It's probably um, of the of the many softwares that even we use at TT is probably the most powerful one and the most most flexible one. Uh, can we go to the next the next slide? Um, so, as I mentioned, one of the first steps that we do is we create that that geometry, and that in creating that geometry, we're basically generating different zones. I'm sorry, was there was there a question? Uh, it seems like it seems like not. Okay, but please do stop me if there's any questions. Um, so we're creating different zones, and and in those zones, um, we are basically assigning a space, what we call a space type in energy, in energy modeling. So I'll give you an example of some zones that we have um, in in this energy model. We have uh, a gym, a classroom, admin offices, maintenance, kitchen, the cafeteria. Um, what we call media, which is related to, which is really like the library. So this, these all, these are all different zones that are incorporated in the energy model, and each one of those will have, um, as I mentioned, different uses, different equipment, different light that are appropriate for each one of those spaces. Uh, of course, we we want to divide this in zones that uh, will represent the different uses that we have, um, and that you know, for their different uses, require us to have them with different inputs. Uh, the zoning in the energy model is actually done following general ASHRAE, what it's called the ASHRAE standard 209 2018. So this is this is um, the way ASHRAE uh, basically standardizes how we're supposed to do energy models for different stages of the science. So ASHRAE will give you guidelines for you know during SD or during concept or during DD. These are the things that you that your energy model should be following. To be able to comply with this ASHRAE standard, um, so uh, the next step is basically to each one of, of to the energy model, we're going to basically add our inputs. So here are the 
overall assumptions that we have for, for this particular building, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you can read them, but basically we assign a window to wall ratio to the building. We assign the, the thermal properties to the different materials, to, to the fenestration, to the roof, to the walls, to the exposed floors, if we have any, to the slab and grade, if we have any. And then um, the internal loads come from previous projects that we've done. Uh, the internal loads also include are coming from uh, basically the code, and they also follow ASHRAE 62.1. Uh, also, airflow rates are coming from there. Outdoor airflow rates are coming from the same the same codes in ASHRAE 62.1. Then we incorporate a schedule. So for Armhurst uh, Public School, and for each one of those zones, we're basically adding, you know, what's the school year uh, hours of use is, what the summer hours of use of use is for for that one um you know the times that you see here uh, are basically the ones that are incorporated in the energy model then we then we add the hvac options um the air source basically heat pump has that is that first column and then the column to the right shows the ground source heat pump for each one um just just to uh make a clarification about this this particular energy model it's hourly so we do uh, 8,760 hours of the year. At each hour, we look at what the conditions are in the air and the ground, and then um, we base with that with those temperatures, we're able to to calculate what the coefficient of performance, basically what the efficiency of each system will be. So at every hour, we're looking at what is the the occupancy, what is the temperature outside, what is the solar radiation, and then uh, what is the efficiency of the system. So uh, um, that's how we estimate the energy use. So here are basically the the, the results for from that comparison. Um, the bar shows the energy use intensity, which is just the energy that the building will be consuming in in the year, divided by the the uh, square footage of the building. Um, the air source heat pump we found it to be around 31.5 uh, in EUI, and the ground source heat pump, uh, as was mentioned before, because the ground has a stable temperature. Uh, its EUI is able to be lower, and so the EUI of the of the ground source heat pump is 24.9 below the the um, you know the 25 uh, goal limit that we have. Below below that, in a darker blue, you see the number of the TV capacity um, DC kilowatts, basically in the units of the of uh, DC kilowatts that would be required for the net zero goal. So uh, as you could imagine. Um, you need a lower capacity for the ground source heat pump as it is more efficient. So 972 kilowatts for uh, the air source heat pump option and 770 kilowatts with the ground source heat pump. And on the right, you'll see basically all the, all the assumptions that we've used. We've used um, this, stuff, this software TV watts. Um, Alonso. And again, the Department of Energy uses for this. Yes. Yeah, I, I, just, want, I just want to um, point out that these are very... Um, preliminary assumptions. Um, the, this was all made before we've even built a built designed a building. So, so the I just I just want everyone to know that now that we have a site, now that we have um, the layout of the building, we know it's going to be a three story. We will be refining all of these. Um, we will be doing another a, a true energy model. Um, now that we have a building, we just gave a square footage before. And I, I, Alonso, I think you just took portions of the building to make certain general assumptions. But now that we know the direction of the project at um, schematic design, we'll have an updated um, energy model as well. We will do it at DD and also at CD. So we will be checking it as the design is refined and more information is in there. So. Um, this is still an apples to apples comparison. I, so, so there's no question whether air source and, and ground source, they're being measured at this with the same assumptions. Got it, just, just for clarity, um, when, you know, the, the data that, that's, that's in the presentation today is really the same for when it, we're talking about the energy models, the same data that we looked at some time ago um, when we were looking at different options and it, as you just said, it, it's kind of a, um, I'm going to call it neutral in the sense that it could have applied to any of them. Um, just for the folks that are listening in and for them to understand the process, 
at which point in the schematic design will the will the the energy model get sort of rerun? Do you have a sense of that yet? Um, typically, uh, Alonso, I, I think it takes a few weeks to run the energy model. So we want to make sure that uh, we have the this this would be done after a um, ground source or air source is selected, right? And and once we have um, more information, so I hate to say it, the the later um, during schematic design is preferred so that we have as much information as possible. Yeah, I wasn't necessarily pushing to to do it earlier. Um, because in my head, I'm thinking of all the things that, that really you want to have a chance to explore and update, like actually uh, doing a schematic elevation all the way around the building so that you can see that, well, the south is really 21% glazing and then right. north is only 15% uh, glazing to be able to have that additional subtlety and, and, and refinement um, and, and honestly, more accuracy. I also see that, that Shelly's got a, a hand up. Yeah, so uh, I just wanted to ask, like, it seems like you've run the energy model in both cases using the same building envelope parameters. And I'm just wondering what studies maybe you have done or you plan to do to dial in the building envelope itself relative to optimization. And particularly, you know, is this decision between air source and ground source is going to be made this month? Um, has, has work been done to see what the difference is between, say, a more aggressive building envelope with air source heat pump versus, um, you know, what maybe you have already for ground source heat pump. But just curious about about the strategy there. Um, I, I can answer in, to an extent that those studies that have been, in terms of studies of the envelope and more aggressive strategies towards um, controlling light uh, thermal efficiency, they will continue throughout SD, but they have not been done in the context of comparing air source to ground source. Uh, but uh, that's a good segue into um, the next couple of slides because we're talking about um, data that has currently been shown in terms of energy use, but updated with the cost estimates that we've gotten at PSR. Um, and then there's also some additional information that we're receiving about incentives and all of that uh, plays into the two options. One of which is, I won't say comfortably, but within the 25 EUI range and the other one is not. So those more aggressive um, studies might have to, uh, you know, be utilized to bring the air source EUI down potentially if, that route is chosen and then maybe not to 25 but there are paths for incentives uh, that are above 25. But but to Shelley to answer your question um, when we start doing the energy modeling uh, Alonso and his team and us I mean and you whoever right um, we'll sit there and say okay well what if we insulate more what what is that what are we going to gain from that so so what's the um, cost benefit analysis. So if we add insulation, it's going to cost X and we're only going to say Y. Is that, does that make sense? So all of that will occur as we start um, getting, I'll say getting into the weeds of the energy sure. model. We will test all of the various components that may make the building more energy efficient. Yeah, that, I... I yeah, no doubt that, that that will that will happen. I'm more more leaning, just kind of asking the question around supporting this decision between air source and ground source, just to make sure that um, the optimization of each of those systems in respect to the building envelope is also considered. And I know it's difficult to do that, but maybe this test areas, you know. It, isolating certain areas to do a quick comparison just to see i'm i suspect the ground source heat pump is is going to be the winner in terms of life cycle cost analysis that said for the sake of you know the committee knowing and being able to present that back to the public and say yes you know we we tested this thoroughly and that is the case 
it's more surrounding that really where I'm where I'm asking. Okay, so um, and and maybe others un understand your question differently, but I think what you're suggesting or asking is if we modify the model so that perhaps air source has more has more insulation or less glazing or something that might bring the EUI down. However, the cost may go up, but it might not go up incrementally to the to the first cost of a brown source. Is is that exactly that's exactly what I'm saying. Okay. Yes. Okay. We can we can talk and again I think um, because we are just starting the design, it would be appropriate, I think, what is what you said to use the information that we have on this, like the, the sample spaces. I at, think that would be point. sufficient. I think okay. that would be sufficient to make this decision just to, to make sure that, you know, all the I's have been dotted, the T's have been crossed. Yep. 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 Thank you. Yep. Kathy, did you have your hand up? Uh, no, I, I was going to restate Shelley's question, but you did it, Donna. I think she was asking what, what you just said, that if we were more aggressive on the envelope, a, the air source would become more efficient, but we would be spending more on the envelope if we did that. So that is, um, instead of apple to apple, it was an apple to an orange. You know, it was something a little bit different for air source is what the question was. Mm -hmm. So I think that will help. I mean, these numbers um, are quite a bit higher than what we saw in March um, for these systems. Um, so, so I was that was all I was going to do was okay. Okay. restate yeah, what well, I understood her to be asking. Yep, yep, yep. Well, we'll certainly take a look at that. And, and I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt the the the, um, the answers that the team and Donna um, were providing. Uh, I just wanted to confirm that it, it generally takes like a, a week or two to update the energy model, just like Donna mentioned. Um, so that's the reason why you know we would like to to, to wait until we have um, you know the, the as much as we as we kind of the design to incorporate into the the energy model, and um, also as as Donna mentioned the, this sort of like instead of apples to apples, maybe apples to orange comparisons, it's also, it's also possible. And now that we've updated the energy model um, and if we decide to update it later as well, uh, that's a comparison that we can do uh, easily now that we have this, 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 um, this energy model. Great, Tim, did you wanna uh, yep. tackle this? the slide at this point. Um, yeah, uh, as Kathy said, the costs have gone up um, considerably. Um, a lot of it is just uh, the state of the world right now um, and, and a little bit more detail in the cost estimates. Um, but this is the basis for the uh, slide that you will see next that shows the uh, life cycle costs of the various system. Um, the PV Tim, array has. Tim, yeah, uh, sorry. I just want to mention that these costs were um, included in the PSR cost estimate. So these are not, I mean, these these are not incremental to to the cost estimates for, for the entire building that we just showed or shared with the committee. That that is correct. These these are the numbers from the cost estimate for the PSR. Mm -hmm. So you have seen these, but these are in the format that they were last presented yeah. to the net zero committee right. as a refresher. And, and there are different numbers from that time, but those were much earlier numbers. Correct. Um, and so here is lifetime costs of the various systems. And actually, Alonzo, if you could just speak to the methodology a bit. Absolutely. So we we basically ran L, uh, an LCCA analysis. Uh, we received, as, as as I mentioned, we have updated initial costs, um, which we uh, input into into our into our analysis. We have the basically that initial capital cost for HVAC uh, that includes not only the HVAC but in, in the case of the ground source uh, heat pumps the the wells as well. 
uh, of course, the ground source heat pump, that's why it generally comes out uh, higher than the air source heat pump at the beginning. And then uh, you see different steps throughout the, the, uh, the, the, the light of the system. And we've, we've highlighted the, their um, basically the assumptions of when we think the, there would be a replacement and what percentage of, of the capital cost it would be uh, for years, uh, basically 16, 21, 31, 20, 41 for air source heat pump and ground source heat, heat pump, respectively. Uh, we're also taking into consideration APV replacement at year 26. Um, we have included the uh, mass safe incentives as well. Uh, and then the utility cost and the maintenance cost are, are considered uh, neutral. And uh, part of that is uh, related to the fact that the PV uh, would basically um, Give, give us the exact same uh, uh, annual utility costs for them, and so at the end of the of the of the life cycle analysis that it, that in this case extended all the way to 50 years, uh, the ground source heat pump ended up at 30.3 million, and the air source heat pump at 29.2 uh, million under this under this assumption. Um, and then. Sorry, Kathy Get. had it. Kathy had it. Oh, and sorry. Just, just, when you're doing the replacement, just so I understand it, for the PV, it's just the panels, so we're not having to pay for canopies again, correct? Um, that is correct. And then for the ground source, the chill beam stays. Do do you ever have to go back? Stuff inside the walls, as I understand it, um, or the pumps or the wells. You know, as I'm taking apart what what the parts of the ground source are. So, so the chill beam are the the units in the classrooms, and those do have a replacement life. Um, the wells, which are outside in the ground, um, they do. Um, uh, they are. For the foreseeable life of the building, um, a one life cycle cost item. They do not need to be replaced. There's a 50 year warranty typically on the loop in the well and the casing itself. Um, and then the various other fittings and uh, devices within the building, uh, there is a replacement life. Thank you. Um, this is just some detail uh, for the utility incentives that were uh, single line items, two slides before that showed a slightly higher incentive for ground source versus air source. Um, and then what this doesn't show that there's also an incentive path for 26 to 29 EUI um, that if air source is selected, maybe the building targets to get to that 29 to achieve some but reduced incentives. Um, another thing that we should mention that uh, in the near future, and it's currently under review by Eversource and Mass MassSafe, um, the ground source heat pump at or shown as $600 a ton is scheduled to um, be increased significantly. Um, we don't have an exact number, uh, but the high end of the numbers we've heard would put the total incentive package at about 80% of the difference of the capital cost between air source and ground source. So um, we expect to have that information in days and it, it will likely be something significant that the committee will want to consider when making this choice. Uh, Rupert, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. I was hoping that you could clarify which incentives are and are not included in the comparative pricing that we've seen so far, but it sounds like it's gonna be updated shortly anyway. It is gonna be updated shortly, but I can tell you that for um, ground source, it includes everything seen here. So it's $2 for construction, $1.50 post occupancy, and that's $600 a ton, which I can believe it's $270 a ton for the system. Um, and then for air source, it's not shown on this, but there is a reduced construction incentive of $1.50 per square foot and the uh, the, the VRF adder, so that works out to be about a hundred thousand less in incentives. But um, you know, the ground source heat pump adder, as it's called here, uh, potentially could go up to significantly. Uh, we we don't have a any, number. So, did so, they have any sense of when they were going to publish this new standard, and it will it 
be something we'll be able to consider as part of our decision making, or is it's going to it's going to come to downstream for us to kind of wait around on a decision? I spoke to someone from Eversource yesterday, and they said midweek, meaning this oh. week. So oh. that okay. now I I. Uh, Go ahead. Spoiler I, I, alert! Spoiler alert! Just just it's significant. Like we can't divulge everything. Yeah, it's not hundreds; it's thousands. It's yeah. it's okay. significant, and yeah. it, we just this is a verbal, and so we don't want to overstate anything. But um, this the, it's a huge incentive for two things. One is to get the site EUI. I think they call it twenty four point nine, so not twenty five or less. I think they're saying it needs to be twenty four point nine. So um, it would be in our best interest and we're going to have to talk about strategies how to get right. to 24.9 but that's um getting to 24.9 with the verbal that we received tim it it almost almost it doesn't completely it's slightly more um out of pocket to the town of yeah i mean if you take the high end of what they said it could be it would be of the of the one point nine two difference between the air source and ground source, the incentives would cover one point seven. So that's it's significant. significant. Yeah, but but um, but, so but we've also heard that since the incentives will be so large, um, and they're essentially going to be reviewed on a case by case basis. So we we can't definitively say anything, but there's a good chance that the incentives will go up enough that will alter the calculus of the decision. And then I think the only other point that they made is um, no gas. And, and we all are aware of that. But what that means is for an emergency generator, we would have to look at alternative fuel sources. So um, diesel, whatever. But, but again, um, well, the generator for a diesel is huge. But but comparison speaking, and that that might speak more to um, the town's bylaw about staying off of gas. But um, that that's one little other kind of caveat to it. I see two um, hands up, Kathy. I think you were first. Uh, yeah, I just um, you know I'm kind of repeating Rupert's question a little bit, but these incentives um you tim you know how many tons we have of gshp so what does the two dollars <coughs> per square foot and what does this ton translate to and i i'm asking that more not necessarily that you do this right now but when we find out a week from now what these numbers go to if you could translate it for us into because what i'm remembering is um when eversource first told us this it was in the five hundred thousand dollar range for ground source um so it was much more than those little tiny incentives you showed us in march or smaller incentives and then the other thing i i think it requires that um and this i was just in an ever source briefing when they did this so for others know it but it requires the town to early on enter a memorandum of understanding so it's the town of Amherst doing this. It's not the designer so that we get these uh, payments. And it says the end of construction. It says that mean when the building is finished? So I just have a trying to understand when do we, if we do this, when do we get the money? Um, and so are we getting the money in 2026 as opposed to when we bond it? Um, and those are just, these are a series of questions relating to us thinking about the financing of it. Yeah, um, I can answer partially. Um, uh, the construction incentive and the adders are paid out during construction, and then, uh, as it says, payable at the end of the occupancy and verification is the other half. But it, it's probably a two-thirds construction, one-third breakdown. But we can do the math. Okay. Thank you. Rupert had his hand muted. Up. Rupert? Yes, okay. I got the unmute to finally work. Um, I think you may have answered my question. On all of these incentives, are they based on simply on modeling 
or uh, are they subject to measurement and verification? And what's at risk if we uh, don't meet the uh, measurement and verification benchmarks? Um, it's both. Uh, some of it is modeling, uh, but uh, you, you don't get the second half. The 150 is based on verification and you do not get that incentive until proven performance, uh, but there are some incentives for intent. And that's all spelled out in the memorandum that will have to be signed with uh, the utility in the town. Um, and just to wrap up is... Um, so, uh, right. Um, so we just, we, we are going to have to be as confident and be prepared for alternatives should the usage change or some of the parameters get modified. So um, this is going to be an ongoing conversation, like, thanks for signing up, guys, but your job's not done once you pick a, once you pick a solution, because there are going to be lots of conversations that we're going to need to have to make sure that we have that buffer. Yeah, so this slide just shows the EUI for the two options and the energy use. Um, for the various options, um, as you can see, air source is 31.5, just outside of that um, incentive range. Um, the incentive range for air source are not the big numbers that we were just talking about. So uh, doing what is required to maybe bring that down is will probably be a tough decision if we go that route to get to Shelley's question. Um, and then one more bit of information on here is the carbon emissions between the two options. Uh, so in addition to money and life cycle costs, there is a, a, a carbon difference in, in the use of the buildings with the two options. Kathy. Quick question. Um, on the, uh, the kilowatt hour annual, um, I think you have what we currently use in Wildwood and Fort River. Um, we got that on, in a full year of kilowatt hours. At some point when we're putting this together for the broader public, I, I would like to be able to show uh, what, this, what this building, all electric building would use compared to the two buildings that are not all electric now, Tim. And you have that information already, correct? Um, we do have that information. We do not have it in this presentation. What we do have in this presentation is the cost, but that's um, a manipulation of that data. And you're also getting a great reduction because you're producing energy on site, um, which uh, this slide essentially has been seen before. Uh, but with 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 the electricity going away, uh, or at least being produced on site and gas and oil, um, you're looking at significant savings in operating costs in terms of fuel uh, and utility uh, moving down the line from the Ranger. There it is on the screen. In this case, then, the natural gas was probably assuming that we were doing a natural gas generator. No, that's uh, Fort River has natural. So oh, Jonathan, that's right. That, that's right. That's right. That's that, right. The first yeah. column is the actual. Well, the, the actual, actual is yeah. FY twenty three. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and then that column shows the heating with the fuel oil for what? Well, yeah. um, and and there, if we do end up with a gas generator on. Fort River, there will be some costs associated, but obviously it will not be any $36,000, yeah. Yes. Um, so that is actually the presentation that we have if we wanna open it up for questions and discussion. Um, and the slides that are here, you have seen already. Yeah, Tim, the only, the only other thing I, I wanted to point out on this proposed site plan is where we preliminarily just identified the well field um we've already started having conversations you know there's um i don't know if people are going to get into the weeds if not today maybe later working with nate and bruce from gza we're talking about bringing it closer to the building going around so that we're um not in the wetter part of the site so this is all very preliminary as it relates to uh, ground source 
Shelly had her hand up. Yeah, I just want to um, ask about refrigerants. Regulations are changing. I'm I'm curious to hear what your perspective is on just the risk analysis of using a system with refrigerants is re related to regulation changes, re re also related to just environmental impacts. Is that maybe something that the committee would want to take into consideration as well? Yes, we, we've had uh, community members uh, ask questions related to that as well. Uh, it's reflected in the LEED certification process. That's why they had an item that says enhanced refrigerant man management credit, which really basically re uh, reflects to amount of refrigerant in the building. Uh, and when it comes to regulation changes, uh, manufacturers will probably have to reflect that. So if it changes in, let's say, five years, uh, it's something that I cannot really predict. Uh, anticipate. Uh, when it comes to probably five years ago, we used to have a lot more concern about refrigerant leaks uh, because uh, back then all the connections, a lot of the connection used to be mechanical connection switch locks and they had a lot of issues with that. But uh, since then we've been requiring all the connections to be braced. So we haven't had any issues with that. Uh, probably another thing that's uh, potentially is that for large refrigerant uh, uh, plants, there is a refrigerant detection requirements and this purge uh, system requirement in case of the uh, leakage. But because each uh, VRF system components are uh, just below the threshold that requirements, they skate by that, but I think they may be catching up to that pretty soon. Uh, Simone, I, I, am I correct? to assume that there would be some refrigerant use in both systems, or is it really just refrigerants in the, in the air source? Uh, in geothermal system, all the refrigerants uh, uh, was it, uh, isolated to mechanical, world, which will have a, a refrigerant leak detection system and purge system in case there is a leakage. In the case of uh, air source heat pump system or VRF system, all refrigerant pipes are all over the building. And I mean, literally all over the building. So it's, it'll be throughout the building and there will not be any uh, leak detection system. So I'm gonna ask if, if uh, you know, committee members have questions first and then, uh, then open it up to the public. And I see Rupert's hand. Thank you. Um, uh, a question on the ground source heat pump versus the, the air source uh, uh, heat uh, system uh, with the maximum 20 ton uh, systems in VRF, it sounds like we'll have a fair bit of redundancy. If one system goes down, the whole building won't freeze. Um, I'm imagining for the ground source, there's only really one compressor unit and when it goes down, it's down. Is, is my perception correct there? Uh, no, fortunately, it's not correct. <laughs> you have a central plant, but it's a modular system also. So you will have most likely four modules of 80 ton units. So they, one of them goes down, which each one actually has two compressors. So you, you do have a redundancy. Each of the pump will be duplex. So you have a backup system and there's a lot of redundancies. Uh, in some ways, if you look at VRF system, it is modular, but each zone covered by 20 ton does not have backup. So that if that goes down, uh, area covered by 20 ton will not have any backup. You just have to keep the doors open so that, that area doesn't freeze. Kathy? Uh, yeah, this is um, someone who went to a lecture that I missed on ground source talking about that if you're in New England and you're not operating the building a lot in the summer, let me say, hope I get this right. So you're not um, putting the heat back into the ground. Um, is there any deterioration over time as we're taking heat out if we're not replacing it? And I saw that you, I think I saw with the hours, we've upped the hours of summertime use for some of the 
primary areas of the building. So it's, it's a, just a question of, is there anything specific to a climate um, where we don't necessarily need a lot of air conditioning in the first part of June, which is this in elementary school or September. So that was my question on year round versus uh, seasonal. Okay. Uh, first of all, all new buildings, I mean, all new school buildings is a cooling dominant. That is, you need a lot more energy to cool than heat. Uh, so it offsets the uh, number of uh, hours that will be operating in cooling. And the uh, well-designed, Nate could uh, was it, uh, back me up on this one, but it reflects that. The, was the balance between heating and cooling and its seasonal storage effects. Yeah, the energy modeling would take into effect or into account um, you know, the, the duration of heating versus cooling and the demands. And so with, with ground source systems, you know, you're either designing for a peak demand or an annualized energy demand. And the annualized energy demand, if you can design for that, is more efficient in terms of the number of wells and the size of the system. If you design just for peak capacity, you wind up with a much larger system. So that's where Alonzo and his his team uh, come in and helping to, to sort of optimize the size of the well field based on the design load case that you're given. But that's an important point too, that the load case really matters for these systems to operate efficiently. One of the biggest issues is actually, uh, in our experience lately, is when you under predict the air conditioning, the cooling requirements, because what sometimes happens is when you build a brand new building and now you've got wonderful new space, it's air conditioned, people want to use it, right? So the, the actual demand, yep. it wasn't there before to use the building goes up. And sometimes it's not the whole building. It might just be you know an auditorium or a gymnasium or something like that. Now all of a sudden summer programs, everyone's looking to use that space because it's comfortable. So that can actually become a more of an issue if you heat soak the, um, the the formation and lose your capacity for cooling. It's, it, it, that can be a bigger issue sometimes as well. And I guess that just goes back to establishing the correct parameters of usage of the building. And mm -hmm. it's, I you know, if you build it, they will come, right? So um, it, we really are gonna have to create some strategies to put in place to make sure that we have all of these, they're, they're wild cards, right, um, are in place um, so that we do hit the, the minimum EUI as, as possible. And I think usage is, is the one thing that we can't necessarily control. Like people even get into the weeds on plug loads. And, and what are we gonna tell staff you can't you can't use plugs. Don't don't turn on the laptops. Don't charge the laptops. Like so. So the, these conversations truly, um, we're we're going to have to get in the weeds on here because we're making certain assumptions, and now we're going to have to back them. Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to uh, go back to um, one of the I think principal differences inside the building between the ground source and the and the air source. Uh, models, which is the existence and use of chilled beams versus fan coils. And in particular, um, I think we talked about this a little bit before Simone, but I'm, uh, uh, I'd like you to refresh me on uh, what happens with uh, uh, filtering out uh, particles and contaminants uh, in an indoor space where you just have a chilled beam. You end up needing some side stream filtration system in order to uh, do that whereas with a fan coil do you have some degree of recirculation where you're uh, getting a chance to filter out particles etc uh what's that roughly one third of the air circulating in in the uh, classroom is from the primary system which is well uh, well filtered and is 100 percent outside air and two-thirds is from the induction so that portion will not be filtered Versus if you use fan coil unit, you will have, uh, uh, what's it, you could have filter in there. It's a, there's a pros and cons in two duct type of system. Chill beam system, you don't have duct work. It's extremely quiet. 
And based on my observation, if the space is really dirty because of a, uh, what's it, a, it does not have any shelter. If I go uh, visit the schools after two or three years of operational, it should be, should be in coral, should be caked with the dust, but I haven't seen that yet. And Chill beam, of course, has almost no uh, maintenance requirement. While you have a fan coil units all over the place, that you will have a, a what's it a requirement. And currently, fan coil units, while it's probably more flexible in design, uh, the quality of fan coil units still hasn't improved. It became commodity product starting from about thirty years ago, so. Acoustically, we have tough time uh, also predicting it. Whatever the publication says is much louder, louder in activity, actual. And it also has uh, exposed fiberglass lining, which deteriorates after about 10, 15 years. So those are the things we could think about probably uh, before we start an SD. <laughs> you have a if I can follow up on that, um, uh, you had mentioned uh, the um, the fan coil units have filters, but they need more frequent changing than than your typical air handler. Do you have a sense of is that like monthly or four times a year? Or I mean, right now we're changing them. I think three times a year in most of our schools. Uh, three times a year is usually pretty good because if you have an air handling unit that uh, takes care of most of the pollen loads during the spring, it should be okay. What I was referring to is that sometimes people say fan coil units could, they make a MRF 13 filters for fan coil units. And when I talked to a good friend who's a filter sales rep, he sort of chuckled. He says, we give whatever people want, but most of, of uh, efficiency comes from static electricity charge. So it meets initially, but he says after a few days, it's down to MRF 11. <laughs> so, People need to be aware of that. Thank you. Other questions before we open it up to uh, community members? Great. So Kathy, I, I can't see who, who may yeah, be I, waiting, so. Okay, we have two. I'm gonna bring the first person in. Um, I'm bringing Bruce in and Bruce, you are with us on the screen, if you unmute. Okay, am I around? Yes. You are. <laughs> um, I had a couple of uh, questions. Uh, the first had to do with the load imbalance that Kathy asked. Um, and I was very interested in the answers. That was very reassuring. Uh, I guess I was looking at the energy model closely to verify that that's the case, that the load imbalance does not exist. And, and to the extent that Nate mentions that the load imbalance could actually be uh, uh, more cooling than heating. Um, we were thinking that in order to maintain the load balance, because we were concerned that uh, the COP uh, assumptions which are favorable for ground sourced heat pumps could diminish if uh, we got that wrong and some of the benefits that we were looking for would uh, uh, kind of disappear and that was a sleeper that we didn't want to happen so a number of us will be paying attention to that I mean of course you are as well but when I say I, we Chris and Rudy and I have been talking about this off and on for a while now so that was all very reassuring um, what is uh, still um, uh, perplexing me, and if you would go back, if you could, to the slide where you're comparing EWI and PV comparison, that's the heading, EWI and PV comparison. And I'm sorry to ask this, but this will help me uh, make this question, which I've already asked before, about four or five months ago. There we are. Now, I want to make sure that I understand correctly, and therefore everyone else does, that when you look at this diagram, you think, oh yes, the, uh, the heat pump load, the air sourced heat pump load is a little bit more than the, the load uh, of the ground sourced heat pumps. In other words, the ground sourced heat pumps are a 
efficient, uh, more efficient or more effective. And if you look at this diagram, you think yeah, it's about, you know, it's, it's about 20% or so more efficient. But, but these EUIs are not heating and cooling system EUIs, they're whole building EUIs. So the top 20% of that 24.9 column, which is down sourced heat pump, the top 20% of that is, uh, or maybe yeah, the top 20% of that is the load that's attributable to the, the ground sourced heat pump. And if you go horizontally across, now you see that the, if I understand it correctly, that the, the, uh, the demand, the energy demand, the EUI fraction of the total demand for air sourced heat pumps is over twice what it is for a ground sourced heat pump. Now that doesn't seem possible for me because that says that you are assuming that the coefficient of performance, system coefficient of performance for an air source system is um, twice, or see, sorry, the ground source heat pump system is twice as efficient or effective, a COP of six, let's say, as opposed to a COP of three or less for an air source heat pump. And I've never seen that. And it doesn't seem possible, it just seems wrong. And I asked this question about this diagram four months ago and really didn't receive a satisfactory answer. And uh, I'm hoping that this is, as Donna said, um, something that will uh, be, um, will change. But it really is a conference in its rattler for me because this says these folks are making just totally unrealistic and unreliable and wrong assumptions about coefficient of performance for these systems. And so when I look at this, I say, well, what else is not right about this? So this is really a rattler for me. And I guess I just want to be sure that first of all, I'm understanding this correct. And I've thought about this a lot and looked at this repeatedly, and it doesn't seem as though I'm wrong. So why is it that there are assumptions that are so wildly separate for coefficient of performance for these two systems. It doesn't seem possible. I've got a few other questions, but I can put those into email. Generally speaking, I think this was a very helpful session and this is uh, particularly the incentive uh, information which is yet to come, but it, it, it all seems to be heading in the right direction. And this is just this outlying rattling um, illogicality that doesn't I can't understand yeah absolutely I'm, I'm I'll try to respond to um, to that to that question um, so in general when we look at the coefficient of, of performance of the of the two systems we end up with something around what what you mentioned so so about two points two point eight or something like that for the for the uh, air source heat pump, and when we look at the ground source heat pump, it would be around uh, 4 point, 4 4.1, 4 4.2, something like that. Um, so that accounts for, for a little bit of, of the difference um, in, in average, right? Ultimately, the energy model would look at each hour and it, will, it would find that in general, the ground source heat pump is more efficient just because the temperature of the, of the condenser fluid is, 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 constant, is more constant throughout the year. Than with our source heat pump, um, there's a there's a second added um, element to it, and it it is that uh, we're able to share uh, more load in the ground source heat pump than in the air source heat pump for the domestic hot water system. So there are also some savings in the domestic hot water system that come from the fact that we're using the ground source heat pump that we cannot do with the VRS, um, and that is. Basically, when we're doing the cooling with the ground source heat pump, that heat rejected can be reduced to produce domestic hot water that we couldn't in the in the um, air source heat pump. So those are the, the the two main elements that are part part of the um, of the of the difference in between them. And um, you know, as, as I'm responding to this question, I'm thinking how how I could be able to show this. Um, Clear and maybe you know the way to do this would be 
uh, looking at the actual EUI breakdown that um, we do have, but and, uh, unfortunately it's not on the slides. Um, to basically look at each component and, 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 you know, as you mentioned, a lot of it is ultimately the same between the two of them, right? The, the equipment, the lights, um, the pants are a little bit different, but, but in, in general, they're, they're pretty, pretty similar. And that's that last part of the cooling, the heating and the domestic hot water that is causing the, the, the ultimate change. Um, it is not, you know, but maybe just try to help the, this, this part of the question, it is not uncommon for us to see a significant difference in the in the energy of the ground source versus the air source. Um, even though it would seem like the you know the rated COPs are not that different because of that um, hourly effect where um, the ground source just takes advantage of a, a milder temperature of, of heat rejection. Mm -hmm. Oh. Thank you for that. That's um, uh, certainly begun to ease my, uh, and, yeah. and, I, and I, I certainly want to have my anxiety eased on this point. So I think it would be helpful to make this comparison just on the systems alone and not confuse it with the rest of the building because it, it's a, yeah. and then secondly, let me just wait and see the energy model. Let me be patient. I think your description, Alonzo, of how the energy model is constructed, what the systems are, how long it takes to do various things, the way it was very um, uh, uh, reassuring um, and your command of the, of, 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 of the, of the, 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 the concepts and so forth as described to us, I think was also reassuring. So I'm, I'm, um, I think I'm going to be happy, but I, this was just something that's been getting at me. So let me calm down uh, and, and, and focus on other things uh, more constructively and wait until you finish your model. Thanks very much, Alonso. And no problem. And, and, and absolutely, I, I think, um, you know, I do, I do want to make sure that um, your question is, is, is properly answered. And I think, um, I'll make, I'll try to, you know, reach out the, the, whichever way is possible to, to show may, maybe the EUI breakdown and go through, um, you know, sim simple, simple, um, ways to check whether, you know, yes, we have this difference in, in COP. Yes. We also have this difference in domestic hot water. Um, you know, may, maybe we'll look at the hourly COP and, and, yeah. and, you know, just to, to make sure that the answer is the, the, uh, the question is fully answered. I, I had not thought of the, the DHW component, and, and uh, that's um, helpful as well. And um, your concern is noted, Bruce, and we will uh, change the graphic so that the breakdown is apparent, and we will respond to the comments that you have forwarded such that um, you know it, it's clear that your items are addressed. Yeah, I, uh, Tim, I don't think this is going to have a great deal of bearing on what you all and, 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 and we think, I, particularly if the... Uh, incentive structure is as we uh, as you indicated that it may be um, it seems to head very strongly in a in a ground source heat pump direction all sorts of other things seem to suggest that that's as an intelligent route to go um, what it does mean is something that Donna mentioned earlier is that if we are hanging our hat on a substantial uh, incentive payments favoring the ground sourced heat pump and it's a it's an EUI of 2.24.9 that we have to hit then that shifts our concerns and focuses to assumptions on plug loads and then managing and and I think uh, I certainly are going to start to be as helpful as I can on uh, helping the community understand uh, what that means because it, it means a lot. Um, I see, Jonathan, I made you co-host so you can see this too. There are uh, one, two, three other people with their hands up and I'm going to um, bring the one that's a phone number in. Um, let's see, who did I bring in? I brought in, I seem to have brought Chris Riddle in. But anyway, um, I will bring everybody who has their hand up in if I can do it correctly. <laughs> Chris, I have more experience doing it than I do. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Chris, you're in, and the phone number is also in. I think the phone number had hand up first. This is uh, ends in 08, 08100. Yeah. Yeah. 
just I have a couple of <clears throat> concerns uh, because I can't see the visuals. Can you, can you let us know who you are, by the way? Yeah, Vincent O'Connor, Summer Street, Amherst. Thank you. Um, one night, <clears throat> um, I assume that this has been done and have not seen it, but um, to, to the extent that the system um, is based on projections of air temperatures, both annual and, you know, uh, I mean, the idea that we don't need cooling um, until June is uh, not really a good assumption. No, I didn't or, mean that, Ben. Sorry, I misspoke. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, and we certainly have had many Septembers when we have needed cooling in September. So I'm, I'm concerned that this is a building built for 50 years of use, hopefully, that we have, we have some different projections of, of air temperature, year-round air temperature that, that, um, that will inform the decision-making um, that are that presume different levels of successful um, uh, addressing of climate uh, um, change, uh, temperature increases. Um, the second concern I have is um, that e even though there is no preschool um, uh, funding available now, um, and, you know, as somebody who helped successfully get the high school project through the voters in, in, uh, in the mid-1990s, um, one of the big issues was having three different grades in the old um, junior high school. And uh, so those, those two concerns suggest to me that the siting of some of the facilities that, that are designed to accomplish the, the net energy zero um, goals, I think should take into account the possibility that there, there may be located uh, next to this building a preschool, um, or that, in fact, the decision that was made by all the educators involved 25 years ago to reduce the middle school, to create a middle school confined to two grades might be reversed and we would have to find a place for sixth graders. Um, that, that the siting of these facilities should not preclude additions to this building, however, wrong-headed we may believe in this day that such expansion would be. 25 years from now, I guarantee you that uh, there will be a body of parents and, um, and uh, community leaders who will find our, our, um, our views um, <laughs> to be erroneous and will decide to do other than what we think would be wise, we thinking now would be wise. So I just, I am very concerned about the siting of all these facilities to uh, make this a, a really wonderful building, um, not preclude future decisions about both the addition of a preschool and the failure of the sixth grade experiment. So thank you, Vince. Thank you for your comment. And, and the, the final thing is it may, this may be something for which there are grant funded activities is that along with all this, there, some of the facilities of the building that could be impacted for example, glass by um, by the northeasterly flow of of um, severe weather events, tornadoes and hailstorms. There there may be 
hopefully some kind of grant funded act you know uh, facilities that could essentially secure the building against you know a massive uh, you know one inch hailstones do a lot of damage to glass and just to make sure that um, such such uh, events would not uh, cause a really serious disruption to the education of that goes on in the building or to the building itself. And um, so I I would hope that while you're thinking of making this building, also saying that the, you think about the possibilities that weather-related activity. Um, could cause problems, and that, and really see if there are any grants to make sure that the building is secure for the 50 years that it's going to uh, presumably be in service. Thank you, Vince. I'm going to Chris Riddle. You are here as well. Yeah, can you hear me? Am I audible? Yeah. I am audible. Yes. I've got a bunch of a string of bullet points here that I just wanted, I don't want to speak to any of them. I just want to have them be sort of noted and some of them have, we have forwarded by, uh, by email and so forth. Um, here are, here they are. Energy budget, the question of the energy budget, we need to, the energy budget is required by the bylaw and it needs to be, uh, we need to adopt one as per the bylaw. Um, May the, the question is where uh, may the net zero committee amend the basis of design? That's a question. And Jonathan is, seems to think that that basis of design is definitely still on the table. I'm thinking of standards like, uh, oh, I don't know, exterior wall configuration and so forth. Um, uh, we talked about uh, the idea of uh, progressive cooling or, or heating in the well field. So that's, that was one of them, but we've talked about that. Um, I'd like to see a comparison between the amount of refrigerant that's used in, um, in an air source system compared to the amount of refrigerant that's used in a ground source system. I'm particularly concerned about le refrigerant leakage um, and uh, uh, considering that refrigerant is a very highly potent greenhouse gas. Um, uh, and uh, similarly, do we have, um, uh, how, how many field connections of refrigerant is, are there in ground source compared to uh, air source? Um, uh, what, is the, um, what is the aggregate heating and cooling load at the system? Uh, I like to see that, I'm sure Simon could give us a, a variable. What's the total amount of heating and the total amount of cooling annually that we're expecting? Hey. Hey, Chris, yes. am, I the, am I the only one who's having trouble hearing what Chris is saying? I, I'm, I'm hearing, hearing him just fine. I'm hearing I'm, him. Yeah, I'm sorry, sorry, Margaret. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll, I'll just speak loudly, I'm more loudly. Chris, we're um, having a, re a really hard time hearing what you're saying. I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing what you're saying. So I okay. hope you can submit these comments in writing. I will, I certainly yeah. will. Margaret, um, we can hear him just fine. Okay. Hmm. Good. Interesting. And I'm doing um, a live transcript, Margaret, so I'll also have a <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, where is uh, where is well field pumping energy show up um, in the cal comparative calculation? I want to make sure that the well field pumping energy is not some it's not buried in the H internal building HVAC number. Should we, on to PV, should we be considering bad battery storage? And are, uh, is, that, is that on the table? Um, uh, how about a building envelope? What, what about embodied carbon? What about uh, cross laminated timber? What about low energy, uh, energy um, uh, consuming concrete? Low, 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 excuse me, low, low EC concrete. Insulation, the core question of under slab insulation. That's that's a bullet point that we need to we need to final we need to get to the end of, I think. Um, what I don't see anything in the basis of design that talks about um, air tightness of the building. What's the ACH fifty number that we're targeting for this building? Um, 
And on to plug loads and equipment. What, uh, um, well, where, how, where do, how do we attack the efficiency of all the various equipment, pieces of equipment in the building? Um, thinking particularly of kitchen appliances and things like that. Um, the day, whole question of daylighting and the three lead points for daylighting, that's a bullet point that we want to put to bed in the next few weeks. And then is there, um, uh, is there an energy component to COVID mitigation filtration? MERV, MERV 13 filters, have we take, has that been taken into account? There we are, That's what, those are my items. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'll, I'll, I, will, I will send them on by, by email. Thanks, Chris. Um, you know, rather than, I think what we'll do, Jonathan, is take these as comments yeah. rather than have to do, okay, so um, uh, the next person, Rudy, you are, I think, joining us. Can you hear me? Are you hearing me? Yes. yes. Oh, okay, great. Thanks, Kathy. Rudy Perkins, uh, Cherry Lane and Amherst. Um, I just want to second most of Chris's comments. I appreciate that very thorough list of issues to address. I have a couple of uh, particular questions. One is, have we thought about doing part of the, if we do ground source heat pump, which I think most people are thinking is maybe the better way, um, have we thought about doing at least part of it as a horizontal loop, say under the parking lot or under one of the fields to reduce drilling costs? I don't know if there's a net savings in that or if there'd be other complications. Um, why is the CO2 higher in the air source heat pump um, model in your chart? I, I assume that's because of the wintertime draw off the grid that there's a net increase in CO2 output because of that difference, but we're talking about two net zero systems, so there must be some explanation other than the net change um, over the course of the year. So if, if that could be explained at some point. And then in the Fogarty estimate, there was a comment about the details of the ASHP cost difference that was labeled REF branch solder. And I'm wondering what that is. It had a really high unit count, 14,000, I think. And I'm wondering if that's feet of refrigerant line, maybe. I had thought connections, but that can't possibly be. So I'm wondering if there's indeed something like 14,000 linear feet of refrigerant lines in an ASHP model. I just like that clarified. Like Chris, I'm worried about the total amount of refrigerant. The more I've read about this, the refrigerant issue is more on my mind than it ever was before. I realize that's a changing environment. The Europeans are talking about going to hydrocarbons like propane for the refrigerant, which have lower uh, greenhouse impacts, but obviously have other concerns. So um, if we can get a low refrigerant system, that, that weighs heavily towards GSHP for me. But if you could talk about just um, whether that unit count is actually linear feet and if there's really going to be 14,000 linear feet of refrigerant lines running through an ASHP heated system, that would be helpful to know. Um, thanks. That's it. Kathy, do we have anyone else uh, kind of in the waiting? Uh, no, yeah, no. we have um, one more person. Okay, Maria, I have brought you in. Okay, um, I have officially lost the ability to see you guys. It's now just on speaker view for me for some reason. So can you just give a holler that you can hear me? We can yes. hear you. Hi, thank you. So um, just kind of uh, pivoting away from some of the more technical questions of my uh, community colleagues, I just think that this is a good time to remind the community of our responsibilities as we uh, pursue this building, not only now, but into the future. Um, so user behavior, um, I, I know you guys all know this, but user behavior is a big component of do we achieve our EUI goals? Um, and I think that there's been some really good points brought up about what will our summer usage be? And, and I agree with Donna that I think that this could really change going into the future and have this building be much more utilized with camps and summer school, which is currently at Crocker Farm. So I think that's really good to consider. 
But um, other user behavior, as, as much as we can build into the system, and I know that you've considered this, um, uh, ways to change our behavior. Uh, not only the kitchen stuff, but but in the classroom. So yes, we shouldn't. You know, there are behaviors that we can do to. Um, when when are we plugging in our um, our equipment and and that kind of thing? So if there if there's an education component about this, so that when you build us this great building, that we then take care of it and use it in a way that makes it as efficient as possible. And if you can help guide us there, that would be great. Um, the other thing I wanted to comment on is the maintenance going into the future and the replacement costs. I think I saw in the replacement costs that there is consideration for escalation, that, you know, the, the, the replacements that are done, the second round of replacements look like they cost a little bit more. Um, and that's good. I think it would, this is also a good time to think about maintenance in general. And it's great to have a great new building, but then we have to take care of it. Um, and this is more probably for Kathy and, and the other folks in town government to make sure that we have built into our long-term capital budgets doing the maintenance that is required and make sure that we hit those marks and when things should be replaced, they are, be, they are replaced. Um, and I don't know if this is something that you can do, but maybe to, to do another little education component there to talk about what is the impact on the efficiency of the systems and the operating costs when we don't properly maintain, right? So I think that that would be, um, I think this is just an opportunity to bring that up. Uh, thank you, I think you guys are looking at uh, great questions. Um, very excited about the work that you're doing um, and really appreciate you getting us to net zero um, and taking advantage of, of of everything that we can do to make this the best building possible. Thanks so much. Thank you, Maria. That, uh, I think, Jonathan, that is everybody from the public. Do we have additional questions from, from our, our committee based upon uh, what we've heard? Um, I have one um, actually teeing up a little bit of Maria's, I was going to ask, and maybe Shelley's seen it. In one school in Northern Virginia, it's called Discovery, but they, they're a net zero school. They had put um, at the students, it's a grade school, but had dashboards, had things that people could look at. Is that an easy thing to incorporate into a building? And part of it was it got the kids, the parents and the teachers involved in how did we do today? You know, but how much did we generate with the PV? So is, is that something that we would be adding after the fact? Can we look at what others have done to think of incorporating it. And I don't know what this looks like, Shelley. You know, in Discovery, they did a little film so people were looking at something. Um, and I've seen one building on the UMass campus that, but it's a very complicated screen you're looking at. It's in the architecture building. Um, so just thinking in terms of the feedback loops to uh, both user behavior, but also excitement about the building. It's a, a, a thinking of it as learning. So yeah, I, I, yeah, I would say you want to consider all that up front. Um, some of it, you know, is, is super easy to install later. You know, the interaction with your energy outputs is going to be built into the system anyway. And it's just a matter of what's the interface. And there's multiple, like you can pull it up on the web. You can have a monitor that monitors in certain places where you're seeing it in real time. And those are all possibilities. I would say like you want to gear it towards elementary school kids and you also want to make it interactive to the degree that you can. One thing that I've seen that I did in a school that was net zero geothermal is we, we had temperature monitors on the geothermal lines coming in and out of the building so students could actually look and see, oh, the water going out is this temperature and the water coming back in is, is this other temperature. And then the degree to which you can incorporate that into, you know, math lessons and whatnot, calculating, you know, paying attention to how, if it's cloudy today or not, and how much solar production there was, and just, you know, all sorts of creative ways to do that. And there's, there's plenty of examples out there, but yes, I think that should be considered early on, because there may be some things that, that want to be incorporated in just to the infrastructure of the building, other things will be easy to do later on. 
Thank you. I was involved with the UMass Amherst uh, Sustainable Engineering Lab studies. So we visited all that and that building will be, I mean, it'll be the other extremes. We'll have a, like a glass walls and mechanical rooms and all that. But I think in this case, we could be as simple as just one monitor in the selective places. Initially, we couldn't keep it as simple. And because all these things that you talked about displays and all that is in our control system anyway. So it's just mirroring that uh, selected images that's fitted for the uh, children would be you know, easy. Thank Remember? you. Uh, yeah, I'm also from uh, experiences at UMass, um, one of the one of the I think things that worries me about uh, uh, modifying user behavior to uh, uh, try to meet our target EUIs uh, is uh, using um, uh, natural ventilation inappropriately so that we are trying to heat or cool the entire outdoors. Um, and so um, it, it'd be worth having a conversation, I think, about strategies to help inform staff members uh, when um, it's costing energy to open that window. Uh, or in, like, for example, in one of the classroom buildings at UMass, uh, if they have window sensors, which is not necessarily what I'm going to recommend here, but uh, they have window sensors that disables the heating and cooling function in a space that has windows open in order to save energy. Uh, so there's lots of things to think about uh, and ways to try to um, reach out. And it's, it's never too soon to, to have that conversation in my opinion. You know, yeah, I think, for, I think yeah, goes, sorry, so, go ahead, Jonathan. <laughs> sorry, I think it kind of goes without saying that we, you know, that the modifying user behavior is it's it's this this balancing act. We don't want to design to such a fine knife edge that that folks have to be perfect all the time. But there's there's a real educational value in an educational building about talking about what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. Um, and so I, I'm sure this is a topic we'll, we'll, we'll uh, talk about again and again. Yeah, just to add to that, Jonathan, you know, um, depending on the system, it's actually encouraged not to open the windows, right? So, so, and, and we'll get into the exact system once we find out which um, ground source or air source we're planning on going and what the options are for those. But we typically, um, in, in conjunction with the school department will absolutely have um, learning sessions or teach, you know, um, sessions with the staff, not only for this is why you open the window or this is why you don't open the window. It's how you, how, how you adjust the thermostats, right? So, and what we've also found over the years is to even have an entire sustainability um, presentation and discussion with staff so they can fully understand it. And, and as far as usage goes, um, we, we don't want to hamstring staff, but, you know, maybe there are systems that we can deploy, such as we charge laptops late at night with a, when, when, or, or, or different things that um, it's just all about education and you know, we look forward to that and we can actually start it before the building is turned over and open to them. Um, but we don't wanna do it too far in advance because then we, it's gonna be lost. But, but the whole education of the staff is just critically important. And the, and the students too, like your, your kids are growing up with this. All of their families are so invested in this that even for the youngest kids, they'll understand some of it, right? And maybe we can use some of these as teaching tools within the building. Kathy? I have a question. Um, just, I'm just conscious of time, Jonathan. Um, you know, we had a potential recommendation on the agenda today, but what I heard is we're going to be getting more information on the Eversource incentives. And um, on your graph, Tim, you had all of July with this decision, you know, on. So we tentatively, and I haven't gotten from Danisco yet, but we talked about a full committee meeting on the 15th, which is Friday, uh, 10 days from now. Um, so I don't know whether that timing is still right. We haven't posted it, and I wanted to get sort of a meeting schedule, but if we can 
talk about this at that full committee level, but also some of the questions that people are asking about the um, the basis of design that aren't just energy. You know, so so it's kind of trying to get a sense from you of. Um, We've got some unanswered questions. Uh, daylighting is one of them. Can that all be packed into a meeting on the 15th is what I'm asking. You know, some of these, uh, if we want to raise questions about the envelope or the glazing of the windows, or is that okay in August? You know, when, when do we come back to some of these issues with you that aren't just the ground source versus air source decision? It's, it's a question of timing. Um, and we have 15 minutes left for today. Um, and I'm feeling like I would like to have somewhat more information and we could do it at a full committee level um, on the 15th if the timing still works for a meeting on the 15th. Um, since we haven't posted it, it could be a meeting two weeks after that. But I mean, somehow you, you should drive the agendas for us, yeah. Um, I will say that there are certainly things that we can talk about on the 15th and items that are not that are related to, but not necessarily inherently part of the air source versus ground source, um, like daylighting and things. Uh, daylighting also, the, the more we have designed, the more uh, fruitful that discussion will be, uh, because we can talk about uh, the, the nature of the building. Uh, but there are also some facts and some questions about daylighting, uh, why what we've listed for the lead target is what we're listing that we can speak to on the 15th, certainly. Um, so I would say that we will certainly have enough to fill an agenda on the 15th, but and maybe report on this meeting, but we wouldn't be um, confirming a vote from this committee, obviously, with the entire committee. So, so Jonathan, what do you think? Should we just hold off on, you know, I'm just asking the four of us. I mean, I'd like the, the total costs are much higher than last time, although I know the estimates were done in different ways this time and last time, this time it came from forward. Um, so if we knew that the Eversource incentives removed some of the capital costs significantly that would help inform this decision, not just the X per tons, Tim, but X per ton times tons equals number. <laughs> um, so we could actually see it in a little grid, um, knowing that that's still, the town has to take action to get that money. Um, mm -hmm. So that I'm just, for our subcommittee, that's my feeling is I'd rather see those numbers. Um, yes, I would agree. Okay. Rupert, did you want to comment on that? I, I, I'd like to comment on that. I, uh, I think that uh, we should not try to make a recommendation yet. I'm very concerned about uh, the cost difference and I feel like uh, we have yet to really explore how the town can resolve the traffic issues around the Fort River site and what those costs will be. So I'm really reluctant to commit to uh, either, either heating system at this point in time. Thank you. So, Kathy, yeah, for me, oops, sorry, for me sorry. personally, I, I think we need to see those incentives and I think that'll be a, a bit of big help. Right. So, so if ever source is saying the updated incentives will be released this week, um, we could certainly offer to update the presentation and it could be circulated kind of, you know, as a, as a post meeting. So again, still not asking to take votes, but it, it just, helps maybe frame the conversation for the next meeting. So once we have the updated information, we can just update the presentation. And, so and, the, and yeah. Kathy, I would say, I would kind of echo um, uh, Rupert's uh, desire to, to, to have a discussion maybe on the 15th about uh, site planning issues, you know, both with uh, traffic and just generally, um, I think that, that may be a, a path to, to sort of consider. Yeah, I think that, so does the 15th still work, Donna, in terms of there's enough to, you know, yeah. Um, and, and, and I think all of this, what Rupert raised is as, you know, the, not the Tom, uh, our consultants today, but we chose a site 
that is more expensive. We had two choices that is more expensive and uh, it's potentially more expensive for traffic mitigation, although we might be looking for outside funding for that. So I just think we need to really be making a, 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 a total cost kind of decision that the HVAC system is part of that, um, you know, short term and long term. So, so that has nothing to do with the analysis we just saw today. So, so getting a fuller piece of that. So you know, we're, we're hoping we'll be delivering some wonderful news and yeah. then it's incumbent upon the team um, to maintain that, you know, 20, that magical EUI number. Yeah. And, and that, that might be a big discussion point going forward. Well, and, and, and people on that first, when Rupert said, which ones do you get before you've proved yourself? The first part, at least when they presented it, was if you have a realistic expectation of getting there, that's an upfront, that's during construction, that's real money. Then there's the one year post where they look at what did we really use? And that second part is only if, only if we achieved it. So yeah, so I think I, we should, we should, yeah, I think we should break it out. Yes, I, I think agree. it's breaking, bring it, it's just two different pieces. So right. they're both potentially achievable. One is um, they wouldn't be happy if we didn't achieve it, but if it looked like we had a realistic chance, they're, they're giving out the money. So they were even giving it, they said they're giving it to all air source buildings because they've given them a belief that they can hit 25, you know, or hit Round source. 24, yeah. this was Eversource in their presentation. Um, so I, I think that those were my main comments on the way this interacts with next, not this Friday, but a week from Friday. And I think the uh, Simone and Alonso and Nate heard the list of related questions. So some of that around refrigerants, the, the more we can get just, even if it's just on a screen, giving us some of that information, that would be great. We don't have to have another presentation on it. Um, and I think it'd be good if we could find a place to, to you know, kind of uh, post the more technical answers and data uh, to our, our project website. So that it'll be a resource for folks in the community who, who will have, have questions, even if we can't touch on every element uh, in a meeting. Um, before we go, Simone, can can I get you to just to repeat something I thought I heard, which is that you that you have been specifying um, a different kind of connection for the field connections that has been much more effective in reducing coolant refrigerant leaks. Yes. Yes. Uh, at, at the equipment connections used to be swage lock connection, which is mechanical connection, just like you have in your cars and stuff, which is prone to leakage. So we've been specifying the connection be at least six inches long so that braze can make our connections. So it's, it's braze, it's almost essentially like soldered connection like you get with um, piping. Better than you. solder. Solder is a 95.5 uh, lead. This is a much higher temperature. It's used for refrigeration. Okay. That's, that sounds like a substantial connection. And Donna, you had said in an email that Simone was also investigating one other device that had been suggested to us and that you were trying to figure out whether it was worth considering. And, I, and I'm forgetting what the actual name is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this was the Enverid system that I believe Sarah Ross brought to our attention. And uh, we, we have to research it more. It um, in theory, Samoon, if you mm -hmm. if you want me to speak, um, and, and I'm not uh, looking for an answer now. I'm just saying. No, we don't have an answer. But but there, Samoon, why don't you just go ahead and sure. The, the okay. And their system is basically a carbon dioxide scrubbing system. Uh, the uh, technology has been around for a long time, as in like uh, scuba diving, rebreathers, and uh, and uh, nuclear submarines. Uh, so technology is around, then uh, certainly by introducing this and eliminating the, uh, uh, so reducing the carbon dioxide, we could reduce the amount of outside air. So that makes sense. But another thing we have to consider is that we still are feeling aftershock of COVID. 
where everybody's saying, I need a lot more outside there, a lot more outside there. So uh, amount of outside there also, it has uh, not only to improve the CO2 concentration, but to just scrub out the, or dilute the virus content in the air. So I'm not really sure how normal populace would take if you tell them you're gonna reduce it. So those are the two considerations and it's something we still have to do research because it's only a preparatory manufacturer. And we can make the second one by having them have another manufacturer, have it installed in the handling unit. So that's second source, but we haven't found the third source yet. So, so I think what, what is what Emberit is telling us um, is that it re so the benefits, you, you heard everything that we have concerns and still need to vet out. The benefits are um, it reduces your uh, energy usage, right? So slightly reduces your energy usage. And it also potentially would reduce, and I'm saying would because this, this is Enver telling us all this, um, is that um, it would also reduce the amount of equipment. So, so it could technically reduce some costs uh, associated with the equipment. Um, what, what Sumu was referring to is this is a public bid project in Massachusetts, which requires us to have three or equal, uh, even when you do proprietary, even if you all vote, um, we still need four equal. So, um, what we have found is there's another school project that is also in the MSBA pipeline that is considering this. It is not part of the basis of design, but they're still trying to wrap their head around this. So, you know, if everything that they're saying is true and we can figure out how to specify with the or equals, there might be an opportunity for reduced EUI and reduced mechanical costs. So, so there are some benefits, but again, um, there are also some negatives like some ones that are related to COVID. And, and then we, we, I don't know if anyone really wants to be the first public school out there to test this so so we're, we're monitoring all of this very closely um it all makes sense sarah sarah you know um speaks very highly of them as well and so it it in theory makes sense but we we just have to make sure how that that in in fact it really does play out yeah we don't want you to be a beta site so we'll do all the research ahead of time and uh, manufacturers and sales engineers were highly optimistic. Like they told us that this school is specifying. When we dug into it, uh, like sort of considered. <laughs> and I asked them, could I have some applications drawings? They can't get it to me yet. They just show me the product. Okay, how do we connect to it? What utility is required? How much clearance we need? They haven't got it to me. So stay tuned. <laughs> Okay, thank you. We are at our time limit. Um, and so unless there is something that, that, that folks uh, can't save till next time, I think I will call this meeting adjourned. And thank you all. And thank you all very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.